Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kathke. I'm excited to continue on to lesson 20 of the Master Databricks and Apache Spark series. I'm excited because we're starting my favorite language on Spark, which is Python. And we'll be talking about the PySpark module. And we'll just jump in with the introduction. Where are we going in this? We're going to be talking about what is PySpark, why Python, and then talk about Python and how it operates in the Spark ecosystem. So let's start with what is PySpark. The gist of it is PySpark is a library that helps you leverage Spark services. And most importantly, it is cluster aware. When you use Python and especially the library called Pandas, it is not cluster aware. It is only able to work in a single machine with a single block of memory and do the work you need to do. It is completely non-scalable and although it's very useful and handy for doing small workloads on a single machine, the Pandas library really isn't designed to handle massive amounts of data. But it's a great library, and using PySpark, it becomes cluster aware, along with any other services you use through the PySpark library. Now, the most important thing may be that it enables the millions of developers around the world that know Python to jump right in and be productive on Spark. Now, that's pretty powerful. But let's look a little bit about what we mean by that. If we look at this slide, we can see the overall architecture, which I use a lot, admittedly, this diagram, of the Spark services. So we have Spark SQL, which I've definitely talked exhaustively about in my previous videos. MLlib, which is the scaled out machine learning training library, Spark Streaming, and then the Graph Frame Graph X API. So these are a lot of services. These rest on top of the Spark core engine, which was really the original release of Spark. Fortunately, Spark is highly extensible, so they're able to add these new services on top of it. End of the day, it still comes down to leveraging the Spark core engine. So how does Python fit into this? Well, the first thing you need to ask yourself when you look at a non-native language to Spark, like Python or R, is how much of the various APIs within Spark are accessible to this language. The good news is PySpark pretty much covers everything. I would say everything if I knew for certain everything is covered, but everything I've seen is covered by PySpark. It's pretty good that way. Well, remember, Python, as I'm showing here, is not supported by the core engine, which means it's not really supported natively by Spark. But PySpark is a wrapper that wraps itself around the Spark APIs. And by doing that, it creates an interface between your Python code and Spark. And you don't have to worry about how it does that. You just get in and you start coding Python. I want to take a step back, and it's really important whenever you're working on Spark to bear in mind this scaled out architecture. The data is partitioned, and those chunks of data, which are all distinctly separate, right, are spread out among many different nodes in the environment. Each node is going to be processing queries concurrently. That's where it gets its speed. So you have to bear that in mind. And it all comes through the Spark context, the driver program. That's basically, in Databricks case, your notebook. So you pass something through the notebook. It comes through the context, Spark context. It'll go through the cluster manager. And from there, it coordinates the work you're trying to get done. Now, the thing to bear in mind with Python code is if you're doing something like running a Python function, what they call a user defined function, then you're going to want to push that function out to each worker node so that it can run that function concurrently. Otherwise, you create a bottleneck in your application if you're running some sort of a repeatable function. So this is something to bear in mind because that means Python has to be pushed out to each worker node and then execute the code concurrently. Fortunately, it does this really well, and some new enhancements, like Apache Arrow in particular, have made this really perform competitively with even the native language of Scala. The one also thing I would mention about Databricks that I found when I was writing my book is that there's a lot of preset configurations that Databricks has kind of carefully thought out. They optimize things to be for data science team collaboration, and a lot of the switches and configuration options they turn on for Spark are kind of well-tuned for that, and I found it kind of nice, for instance, when I was using it that um, Apache Arrow, for instance, was turned on already for me, and I didn't have to think much about it. So when you get into the Apache Spark world, 
just be you're gonna have to be more and more aware of these settings like Apache Arrow and another package called Koalas and making sure that they're installed and available and things like that so why Python why do I care Python is the number one open source data science ML machine learning and analytics language it's really taken the data science and analytics world by storm and aside from SQL, which is kind of just ubiquitous across any data analysis these days, Python is really becoming the cornerstone of almost everything going on in data analytics, engineering, and data science. So that's why Python number one. The reason it's gained so much ground, and it's kind of a chicken or egg, is that there's vast libraries out there available, free, open source, for doing all this data analysis and data engineering, machine learning training, visualizations, and on and on. You can really do pretty much anything with Python. You can even write full-blown websites with packages with frameworks like Django. I'm working with one right now called Web2Py. You can write mobile apps. But most importantly, the, the area that really just stands out is the area of machine learning and data analytics. And Python is really great because it's powerful and extensible. What do you mean by that, Brian? Why do I care? What do you mean? I mean that it's got a fully easy to use object oriented system uh, paradigm in use. So it's really easy, in fact, transparently easy to create libraries by just including scripts. When you do an import, it's just automatically bringing in scripts. It's nothing complicated. You don't have to do any extra setup. If you happen to have in something you import a class, that class now is available and you can instantiate it. It's really great for the whole object oriented world, but it supports other paradigms as well. So it's very flexible, it, it lets you do just about anything you can think of. And I think that's why Python is just becoming more and more the language of choice. I do want to talk a brief moment about Spark Resilient Distributed Data Sets and the move towards data frames. So originally, RDDs, Resilient Distributed Data Sets, were the only way you could work in Spark. They're still in use. At the lowest level of work going on in Spark is this rock solid block of data called the RDD. The RDD is indestructible and that's its whole purpose. No matter what you do, you can turn machines off and crash them, etc., and you'll be able to bring it back and you will not lose the data sets. So that's what RDDs were designed to do. Extremely robust, very powerful, never crashed because the idea is you might have hardware that could fail, you're running many machines, you don't want to lose a lot of work. The problem with RDDs is they're black boxes. They don't make it really easy to do things. They don't support the idea of treating data as tables. Data frames do. And data frame support, like our data frames, Pandas data frames, the idea of that tabulate data, that support was added in one point something there of Spark. And that means that's available to you. That's a long time ago, so it's available to everybody now. And data frames support a native language paradigm look and feel. Native language, what I mean is, if you've used Pandas with Python, you're going to feel very comfortable using Spark data frames. And the same with R, if you're using R and you're used to R data frames, it's going to feel good that way. Uh, and so, and you'll be able to use the similar kind of methods and properties you're used to when using Pandas. Also, compared to RDDs, and I'm going to demonstrate our resilient distributed data sets early on in this series, when you see that, you'll realize they're not the easiest things to read when you're looking at the code around them, even if the language is Python. But if you're using the Spark data frames, the code is really a lot more interpretable. It's easy to understand. And that makes it a lot better. And ironically, even though it's more powerful, easier to use, et cetera, et cetera, it also performs much better. And that's because Spark has something called the Catalyst Optimizer, which takes what you're trying to do and is able to analyze it and then find the most efficient way to solve the problem, to basically called a query plan. We're going to focus on the data frame API to most of this series because that's really where things are right now. However, there are still some cases where you have like unstructured data or semi-structured data where you may want to go back to using RDDs. It's also good to bear in mind how the RDDs work and what's really happening so it's not completely, you know, a black box to you. You'll understand what's going on under the covers. I want to strongly encourage you to, to go to this link I'm going to put in the description where I did a really fun and exhaustive interview with Databricks expert, who deep dive expert on all Apache Spark, named Dan Safar. And we sat down and we, I asked him all kinds of questions, really important ones from A to Z, but especially we talked a lot about Python and PySpark and 
what are its limitations and what should you do, what shouldn't you do? So I really advise people who are serious about working on Spark, take a look at this. It's a very unusual interview. I haven't seen anything like this because it's just techy nerd talk and no advertising. Also, I'll put this link in the description also, but don't forget the Apache Spark documentation. Even if you're on Databricks, underneath the covers at Spark and everything about PySpark still applies. So don't ignore it. This is really uh, extensive documentation and you want to use it to supplement what Databricks has because Databricks just cannot replicate all of the documentation on Spark. So wrapping up, we talked about what is PySpark and we learned that PySpark is a module that allows you to use the Python language to leverage a Spark cluster. And that means being able to distribute data on the Spark cluster and run work in parallel and make use of the entire stack of services, not only the data frame API, but graph frame, streaming, and machine learning training. So that's a really important aspect. We talked about why Python, and the two big drivers there is because Python is taking over the world. <laughs> and I would recommend anybody who is doing data analysis or data science or data engineering work to learn Python now. You should already know SQL, that's a given. But Python, I would recommend. It is the most popular language on Spark and it is definitely the most popular language, open source at least, I can say, doing data science, analytics, etc. And we talked a lot about Python in the Spark ecosystem. And we can see that it's really gotten to be very powerful. You can now do all kinds of things like distributing Python, use it to find functions and run them in parallel. It supports data frame functionality. And though you used to have to really kind of maintain a somewhat different syntax using Spark data frames from Pandas data frames, if you use the Koalas package, which I'll talk about later, then that allows you to even keep the same syntax. So it's kind of a win, 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 right? And the data frames perform extremely well. The one takeaway I'll throw, show out before we end this is you don't really need to use Scala on Spark anymore. What? You're kidding. Come on. I would say that. I've run that by a number of people at Databricks and, it's, and Apache Spark experts, and they actually agree with that. With the new data frames, with Delta, with all the things you can do, Scala is really more a language you use if you have to, but it's really the underlying language that Spark is written in. You don't need to really write applications in it any. So that's it for me. I hope you like it and stick, stay tuned. Go to the next video when it's available. We'll dig into how to use PySpark. Till then, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Thank you.